name is Marcelo Benzin. I work for Cloudera in the Spark team, and uh, Chao, who is sitting here somewhere, I can't really see people, uh, is an engineer in the, Spark, in the Hive team at Cloudera. And we're going to be talking about uh, powering Hive with Spark. Uh, so a quick, uh, a quick outline of what we're going to be talking about. So just give an idea of what Hive and Spark is to start with. Talk about uh, two uh, things that we developed, one inside Spark and one outside of Spark. Uh, to support the Hive and Spark work, and then talk about what remains to be done in the future. Uh, so, quick primer on what uh, Hive and Spark is. So, Hive, if, for those who are not familiar, is the standard engine for SQL and Hadoop. And by standard, I mean it's it's one, what, one of the oldest uh, that has been out there, and it um, has a lot of users. So, uh, it's not necessarily standard as a there are no waters, just that it's been there for a while. Uh, uh, Hive on Spark, as I was saying before, it's just an execution uh, engine for Hive that's built on top of Spark. Uh, the goal of this project is twofold. One is to run Hive on a modern distributed execution engine and to, to drive enhancements on both performance and stability, both inside Hive and inside Spark. Uh, this is a little bit different from Spark SQL and Hive context. Uh, well, in fact, it's very, very different in that they're completely different things. So you're not going to be writing any Spark code if you're using Hive on Spark. You're basically just executing your Hive queries. And uh, under the hood, they're running on top of Hive, on top of Spark. Uh, just to continue, this is a, a project that has many organizations involved in it, including Databricks, Intel, IBM, Mapar, and Cloudera. Uh, it has been released, uh, the first version of as part of Apache, Apache Hive 1.1. Uh, but it's still a, a young project, and there's a lot of things that need to be done, especially uh, around performance. Uh, so we're going to be talking about things that we did uh, for Spark to support Hive on Spark. So uh, we did a few enhancements to, uh, to Spark itself. Uh, just to cite a few, uh, there's uh, the new API with partition and sort within partitions, which is pretty self-explanatory. Uh, we added a recursive add file that makes it easy to uh, to sync uh, directories with uh, nested directories uh, with lots of files that executors might need. Uh, and we are going to be talking more uh, in detail about the dynamic executor allocation backend. Uh, and also outside of Spark, we built uh, something that we call uh, the remote Spark context, which might sound a lot uh, similar to what you just heard about in the previous talk, and probably yes, but we're still going to talk about the uh, what drove us to, to write this code. So dynamic exec executor allocation. So what were the problems that we were trying to solve? So first, it's hard to know beforehand how many executors you're going to need when you, you run a user query. So the user starts a Hive session, and he runs a small query that might need a few executors, and then he decides to run a super huge query that needs lots of executors. So how do you account for that? Uh, also, when you're running interactive Spark sessions, e even outside of the Hive context, like if, if you're running Spark Shell, uh, uh, or if you're running a Spark session like a JDBC driver connection uh, or a Beeline session. Uh, if you just allocate executors up front, you're going to be holding onto those resources in the cluster, and people will not be able to fully use the cluster if you just walk away for coffee, for example. Uh, so what's the solution here? So basically, you grow and shrink the application as needed. Uh, and this is, this is currently implemented for the Yarn backend in Spark. So just an example of what, uh, well, not an example, but uh, a depiction of how this works. So basically, you create your Spark context, and then you create a job. And this job will have a few tasks. Uh, so uh, as the scheduler starts to, to schedule these tasks, it's going to see that it doesn't have any executors. So it's going to, uh, the, the, the ex uh, dynamic ex ex executor allocation backend is going to start allocating executors for you. So it allocates one then the, the, the scheduler can go and run a task on that one. But there are still pending tasks, so it goes and it alloc uh, allocates a second executor and assigns a task for that one. And at the same time, uh, the first task is finished, so it can go and allocate the remaining task for that uh, previous executor. Uh, and as the task is finished, uh, the scheduler can go and, uh, and start getting rid of uh, those executors and freeing up resources in your cluster. Uh, so uh, what's the future work that we have for dynamic execu executor allocation? So the goal here is that we, should, we want to enable this by default for Spark on Yarn. So you never have to worry about how many executors you allocate. 
Uh, so for that to be a reality, uh, we need better heuristics so that you have a faster ramp up for large jobs and that generally performance is on par with uh, static execution as ex executor allocation. Uh, we also need to implement uh, data locality hints so that if, that if you know that data is, uh, resides on certain nodes in your cluster, you ask for executors on those nodes instead of asking for them anywhere like it happens now. Uh, and also we need to add support for uh, Spark's RDD caching. Right now uh, we can use the, the external, external shuffle service to serve shuffle files, uh, but if you're using actually uh, cached RDDs, uh, they're gonna go away as soon as the executors are killed. Um, so the second thing that we're gonna talk about is the, the remote Spark context. So what were the problems we were trying to solve here? So when you're running uh, Hive Server 2, you run into a few issues because it has to support several users. Uh, the first one is that uh, Spark Context uses a non-trivial amount of memory, especially for large jobs. So you don't want all that memory to, you don't want to have to uh, provision your Hive server to, uh, for a specific number of users. You want it to scale uh, up and down as needed. Uh, Spark itself doesn't really support multiple Spark Contexts in the same uh, process. Uh, you can do it, it's not, not recommended, and you can run into very bad problems if you do that. Uh, also, if you're, if you're just instantiating a Spark context, you cannot use cluster mode, which is very helpful in Yarn if, you're, if you care about uh, actually uh, charging users for their resource usage. Uh, also, from the security uh, side of things, you need to isolate user sessions so that uh, they have no way of reading each other's data. Uh, and also you need to account for users' resource usage in the cluster. Uh, so the solution that we came up with is that we're gonna start uh, the Spark applications that, that run the, the Hive backend uh, as, separate process and then, as a separate process, and then we're gonna interact with them over sockets. So uh, the idea here is that, yeah, as I was saying, you have a long-lived Spark context that's tied to the user's uh, Hive server two session. So on Yarn, this means that the, the the actual process uh, that's talking to, to HDFS and reading the files can, can run with the user's credentials, so all the security is accounted for. Uh, and also the, the remote, remote, remoting API that we added adds um, fine-grained control of the Spark context. So, um, so basically, an example of the API we came up with, it's, it's in Hive, so it's in Java. Uh, but basically you create this client that uh, manages this uh, child process in the back background and you can submit jobs to it. So this uh, job handle that you see is basically a Java concurrent, uh, Java util concurrent future. Uh, and you can, if you, if you want to synchronously get results, you call get or you can do whatever you would do with the future to get the results back. Uh, uh, and the, the, the actual closure that you see in the, in the submit call is actually run inside the Spark context, which is running in a separate process. Uh, so, uh, what uh, needs to be done uh, going forward? So, uh, we consider Hive on Spark right now to be functionally complete, but it needs uh, more testing and benchmarking, so we need to do more work on, on performance optimizations. A few of these performance optimizations that we're looking at uh, next are dynamic partition pruning, which basically means uh, avoiding reading data that you don't need to read. Uh, uh, we're working to, to figure out what's the best way to implement it uh, because uh, it's not as uh, trivial to do it with, uh, with Spark's DAG. Uh, we also uh, want to add table caching. Uh, and one thing that you don't see a lot in uh, TPC benchmarks, but you see a lot in uh, users' ETL uh, jobs, is having to write to multiple outputs from the same RDD. Uh, and right now, Spark doesn't support that. Uh, so it, it becomes kind of expensive to do it. Uh, and if you're really interested in tracking this work, um, Hive 7292 is the, the umbrella JIRA uh, on the Spark uh, issues tracker that tracks everything that, uh, that is being done. Uh, so sorry for rushing through it since we, we uh, had some technical issues, but uh, uh, just going back to the question from before the session, uh, about uh, Cloudera's position with Impala, Hive, and Spark SQL. So we see Hive mostly as an ETL tool, uh, and if you want really low latency uh, uh, SQL, uh, we generally recommend Impala, but we're looking at Spark SQL because, uh, because of the, 
the expressiveness of the language itself and the integration with Spark. But, but if all you, do, all you want to do is run SQL uh, uh, and run analytics on top of it, we definitely recommend Impala. Uh, so are there any other questions? Sure. Mm -hmm. um, I'm not sure I'm familiar with the dynamic scheduler. Uh, but I, I don't think it would be the same because because uh, if you're looking at uh, Spark standalone mode, it doesn't have the, the notion of not running an executor on a worker. It basically starts executor, executors on all workers. So this is basically controlling the number of executors you have running. Uh, 